This is Michael Johnson, oboist with the Tucson Symphony Orchestra. He also has a YouTube channel called Poetry on Plastic. He emphasizes a lot about classical music, although he does metal. He does Japanese city pop and other genres. He talks about gear and anything to do with vinyl records and equipment. I asked him to look through my meager classical LP collection and pull out five wonderful, brilliant classical albums that he really loves that I own, and five shit-ass, dog-eared records that I probably shouldn't have in my collection, maybe should replace with something better. So let's see what he thinks about Mazzy's classical record collection. I'm here in the home of one Norman Maslov, the mid-century modern castle in Seattle, where I've been staying for the Pacific Audio Show. And Mazzy has been kind enough to let me uh, thumb through his classical collection. Um, he keeps it all kind of up here in the credenza, so it's, it's, a, it's a small but well-curated classical collection, but um, he let me loose to see if I could find five records uh, that I love and five records that I think he could improve on. So. Um, let's get started. So I'm going to save the positive for, for, for last. I'm going to go with some, some copies of some records that I think if he enjoys the music on them, he could find better copies. Uh, if anyone remembers a couple years ago, me and Mazzy appeared in a Four Corners video where we uh, talked about some classical records, and he showed this. This is Stravinsky Conducts the Rite of Spring. The Sacre du Printemps. My French is awful, but I'm trying. And this is a uh, this is a Columbia stereo recording with uh, the composer himself conducting the Columbia Symphony Orchestra, which was basically um, some pickup players in LA, mostly members of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And um, I'm trying to remember what pressing this is. This is a two I Columbia pressing. So there's a few reasons why, and I think this is Mazzy's only copy of the Rite of Spring. Rite of Spring is one of the most important pieces in, in classical music period, let alone 20th century classical music. It kind of, it came, it came out right before world, the advent of World War I, and it was kind of the dividing line between romanticism, the romantic movement that kind of was ending in the early 20th century, and what we consider to be modern or modernist classical music. It, uh, the Rite of Spring was a, was a musical bridge into the new 20th century, the modern world. Uh, this recording was done in the 1960s, I believe, either late 50s or early 60s, with Stravinsky conducting this Columbia Symphony Orchestra, which is really mostly members of the Los Angeles Phil. Um, there are some things I like about this recording. For one, I mean, Stravinsky does know his score really well. Um, and the players playing for Stravinsky, obviously, they're playing a piece of music that was daring and new when it came out, but uh, became a standard part of the orchestral canon. And so these musicians are playing what to them is a, is a great classic piece of music with the piece's composer. Um, and so the playing on this is actually quite fine. But there's some things I don't like about this. For, for one, Stravinsky was a very different composer and a very different musician by the time he conducted this as opposed to when it was written. Um, you know, he had gone through cycles of being a minimalist, of being um, a serialist to some extent, uh, different, different phases of his musical career, very far removed from the kind, of, uh, the kind of expressionist Russian music he was making early in his career. Um, so his interpretation reflects that. But also, um, there's, just, there's just some strange artistic choices taken in the conducting of this piece that, you know, May make sense to Stravinsky, but as listeners, they take away some of the thrill of the music for me. Um, another thing is this, this Columbia, this early stereo Columbia sound is just not great. Columbia never had great sound and the mastering and cutting on this is just quite bright. Um, very, very, very bright. So I think there's some better versions he could pick up if he wanted to experience the Rite of Spring. Um, some easy suggestions would be the Georg Schulte recording with the Chicago Symphony on Decca. He can pick up a very inexpensive London copy of that, uh, pressed in England, or he can get the Speaker's Corner reissue that sounds excellent. 
Um, those can be had, you know, he could probably get a used London copy for 10 to $15 and easily get a speaker's corner copy for 30 to $40. So I would recommend that. I would recommend Zubin Mehta and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, you can get an original Decca of that or a, um, the, if he really wants to spend some money, the King Super Analog pressing out of Japan that was done by Cisco. That sounds really good. And then there's also another Columbia version of this piece that was done with Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic, and that has been received an audiophile reissue that sounds a lot better than the original. Those are three performances and three recordings I think he could do better on. Um, it wouldn't be a video of me talking about negative things in classical music without mentioning the Kanye West of classical music, and that is Herbert von Karajan. Um, Karajan is a larger-than-life figure in classical music, um, had one of the longest, most recorded careers in classical music, and an incredibly long tenure as music director of the Berlin Philharmonic. Now, um, I find that the later in life you get Karajan, the worse the recordings are. I think his early career is a lot better. However, and, and some composers he just he wasn't particularly good with. He was not very good, you know, he could barely conduct um, Mahler. He's often criticized for his Mahler conducting. Some other composers are just not a good match with the type of sound Karajan was looking for, which is a very kind of um, blended string focused sound he was looking for in the orchestra. Not a lot of room for solo voices and solo melodies in his idea of the Berlin Phil. Um, however, he was a pretty good Beethoven interpreter and this is by far not the worst copy of Beethoven III you could have, but I think there's some better ones. Particularly, I think Bruno Walter's recordings on Columbia of the Beethoven symphonies, particularly Beethoven Symphony Number no. 3, is a much better sounding and much better performed Beethoven III, the Eroica Symphony, which was originally dedicated to Napoleon, but uh, Beethoven uh, scratched out that dedication when, uh, when uh, Napoleon declared himself Emperor of France. Um, so it's a wonderful piece of music. It's Beethoven's first real romantic symphony. But I think if you were to get the classic records copy uh, that they did a couple years ago, I want to say 15 years ago, they did a reissue of Bruno Walter conducting that on Columbia, and I think it sounds better, and I think it's a much better performance. This is a cool record that, I have to admit, I haven't heard this recording in a very, very, very long time, but this is uh, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Uh, Acts 2 and 3, yeah, conducted by uh, Leopold Stokowski. And this is, a, uh, this is a mono RCA from the early 50s. And I do really enjoy the cover. But there's so many good recordings, great sounding recordings of Swan Lake out there. Um, personally, if you're going to have one Swan Lake in your collection, which I think is this is the only one he has, I would definitely go for the Ernst Ansermé Swan Lake with the Orchestra Swiss Romain you can get a really, really great, beautiful Speaker's Corner reissue of the complete ballet on vinyl. And I think that's gonna beat this in terms of interpretation and sound. Because Stokowski was kind of an oddball. So when you listen to a Stokowski record, you're not, it's almost like you're listening less to the piece and to the composer and more to kind of Stokowski's wild ideas, which is cool. But uh, if you're only gonna have one copy of a piece, uh, I, would, I would look for something else. The Music of Eric Satie, Volume 1. Um, this is played by Aldo, uh, I have to remember how to pronounce his name right, Ciccolini, I think that's how you say his name. Um, this is an interesting EMI recording out of France. The reason I picked this is because if you like Eric Satie and you like this recording, um, which I think Mazzy does, I would say it's definitely worth it to get the original pressing, which is not this angel, not this US angel, but uh, the original French EMI. That's where the tape was, that's where it would have been mastered and cut the best. Um, the US angel pressings, it doesn't matter what you get, if they're pressed in the US, these US angels just do not sound good. So if you like the performance and you like the overall recording, you can always upgrade your angels to either the original UK or in this case, the original French pressing. Um, and that's what I would recommend he does. Finally, I had to end with another Karyon because, well, he recorded so much and so much of it is, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> this is actually not a bad Beethoven 5, but you can, not only can you do better, but you can do better on the same record label. If you want to have Beethoven 5 with that nice, that nice traditional German Deutsche Grammophon label, well, you can get it. You can get um, possibly the best, most revered Beethoven 5 recording ever made, and that's uh, Carlos Kleiber and the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, Kleiber was very, very well known for his Beethoven interpretation, for his um, you know, very stringent rehearsal method, and for getting the absolute best out of the players he was working with. And his Beethoven 5 is far and away the most exciting, the most dynamic, the most, um, the most looked up to Beethoven 5 recording, I think, of the 20th century. So this is cool, but that, that Beethoven 5 recording is a must own if you're gonna have a classical collection and have any Beethoven whatsoever. That's a good place to start. The good news is I found more great records in here than I found records I didn't like. Um, one, I, I was very impressed with Mazzy's uh, early music collection, especially uh, his collection of archive recordings and Telefunken recordings. Um, I picked one of those. This is an interesting Telefunken record, um, Johann Sebastian Bach, Viol de Gamba Sonatas. If you don't know what viol de gamba is, you may see it kind of looks like a cello. And a lot of these de gamba pieces can be played on cello, but de gamba is a slightly different instrument in that A, it has five strings, and B, it has frets. So instead of a smooth board for the fingerboard, like a violin, viola, cello, de gamba actually has frets like a guitar or a, 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 you know, an electric bass. Um, and these sonatas were originally written for gamba, and these are performed on, you know, you know, period instruments in great, great Telefunken sound. One of the most underrated classical labels of the 70s were the, was this German Telefunken. All these records um, sound really, really good. It's a lot of very interesting, you know, 18th century chamber music they were releasing. And I think this is likely a very fantastic sounding record. What can I say about this? Glenn Gould. Beethoven piano sonatas. Um, Glenn Gould with Beethoven is always interesting. Um, I don't like his recordings of the concertos, but his solo Beethoven, I think, is, is really interesting. It's a very different approach to Beethoven because, you know, Gould is, is mostly famous for his Bach recordings. But um, I, I think his, his recordings of the Beethoven sonatas, the few that I've heard, they have this kind of... Um, intimacy to them that you don't always get in the more expressive recordings. Um, so I, I think these are a fascinating listen. And, and of course, his Gould's best recordings are his, you know, 50s recordings on Columbia. This is one of those. I think this is a, is this a speaker's corner or maybe an analog spark, but I know it's a reissue. And I know um, there's been a lot of great sounding uh, reissues of these early Columbia Gould recordings. Um, and I, I bet this just sounds fantastic. You know, earlier Mazzy was setting up and uh, he accidentally stepped on this record. And I was joking, Mazzy, you just stepped on a $100 record. <laughs> uh, this is a very famous audiophile recording. This is um, the Wilson audiophile recording of Julie Steinberg and uh, David Abel playing um, Debussy, Bartok, and Brahms violin and piano music. Um, particularly, I love the Debussy sonata for violin and piano on here. I think it's brilliantly played. And these Wilson audiophile recordings, you know, engineered by uh, Dave Wilson, you know, you might know Dave Wilson from the Wilson Audio Speakers, those giant things Mike at the in-group has at his house. Um, he also engineered some, he also produced and engineered some records that are very, very good sounding. He had his own little label, Wilson Audiophile. Um, and the, the few classical recordings he did are highly collectible. Like I said, this one from the 80s can get pretty pricey. Um, and Analog Productions actually reissued a few of them, this included, so you can pick this up new from uh, from Chad Acoustic Sounds. But both the original pressing and the reissue of, of this chamber music recording sounds so transparent, so immediate. Um, and it's just wonderful repertoire. repertoire. I mean, Brahms and Debussy, their chamber music is so um, deeply communicative, um, so expressive. And, it, and when you have a, a, a record of chamber music like this that's so intimate, and you have a recording quality that can really uh, break down the barrier between the audience and the performer and allow for all the dynamic, all the dynamic expression that the players want to do and it comes through on the system, that's a great record. And this is 
fantastic record. I have it and it sounds wonderful. This is one of my favorite orchestral pieces of all time, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Um, this is a really, really great recording with uh, Fritz Reiner and the Chicago Symphony. Um, the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra is one of Bartok's final pieces at the end of his life. It was composed in a kind of a, a hard period of his life where he was um, in financial difficulty, had a lot of health problems, and um, Fritz Reiner vi uh, was friends with Bartok and visited him and helped encourage him along with, I believe, Serge Kuzovitsky, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, encouraged him to um, complete this uh, uh, concerto for orchestra that he was working on. And Reiner did not premiere it, but he has such a connection to this piece. And it really comes through on the recording. He knows, Fritz Reiner knows Bartok like no other conductor knows any other composer. They, they had a real connection, a real, um, a real bond. This is the classic records pressing, which is really great. This was done by Bernie Grunman. Uh, and Bernie has talked about this being one of his favorite living stereo records he's ever made. Um, this has also been reissued by Analog Productions. Ryan Smith uh, did a cut, or no, I think it was George Marino when he was still alive. So there's, there's two great versions of this you could get. Um, I don't have a preference between the two, but um, Bernie Grunman has talked about how much he enjoyed mastering this record, and it's a fantastic recording, really thrilling piece. And I think one of the more approachable kind of standards of 20th century classical music. Some of, some of, especially some of Bartok's music can get a little um, angular, but I think this is an incredibly approachable piece of orchestral music. And finally, I had to pick a, another audiophile favorite. Um, I collect a lot of Mercury Living Presents, and um, I think it's really cool that Mazzy picked this up. This is one of only two reissues that Analog Productions has done of the Mercury Living Presence catalog, and this is the cellist Jano Starker uh, playing the Dvorak Cello Concerto, one of the more thrilling uh, romantic concertos. Um, this is with the Durati and the London Symphony Orchestra. All of the recordings Durati did with the London Symphony on Mercury Living Presence are worth picking up. There's some really, really good ones there, especially his, um, his Stravinsky Firebird um, on Mercury's incredible, but this is a double 45 that Analog Productions released, and it it sounds great. I'm gonna actually get a view of the sleeve there and watch. I bet this is gonna crack when I open it. Oh, no. But yeah, they did a great job with this. Chad, can you do more of these, please? Please, they're really good. <laughs> um, yeah, this catalog is is incredible. So yeah, as he's got some good stuff here. You know, I was I was skeptical, but I enjoyed flipping through. All right, see you guys next time.